All right, now in Acts chapter 18, starting verse number 1, we see that after these things, Paul departed from Athens. So he's leaving Athens. If you remember in chapter 17, that's when he, he preached that sermon on Mars Hill. He said, you're all too superstitious. And, um, and there was all that in chapter 17. So now he's leaving Athens, and he's going to Corinth. And of course, Corinth is the, is the place where the 1st and 2nd Corinthians are, are written to. To the church at Corinth. And Corinth is still there in Greece. And in uh, verse number 2 it says, And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And came unto them. So here you have um, Priscilla and Aquila... And they were come from Rome because um, Claudius Caesar had, had commanded that they had to leave. So the Jews, they leave. They were in it, they were in Rome. They leave Rome and they come. And now they're in uh, Corinth. And Paul meets up with them. He finds them. And it says in verse 3, And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So basically, this guy, um, Aquila, was a tent maker as well. And that's what Paul's job was. That's what his profession was. That's how he earned his money in many cases when he wasn't being supported by other churches, when he wasn't being supported to go and preach the gospel. He was making tents. And that's what he and that's what he did. And he found Aquila here and he's like, hey, you know, we're both tent makers. Obviously, um, Aquila was, was saved and he stayed with them and they worked together. And then it says in verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So again, we see here another, you know, this, this is Paul, remember, I think it was last week I preached, as his manner was. That was in chapter 17. And now we're seeing here, he's still being pressed in the spirit. And this is an attribute that you'll see of the Apostle Paul. I mean, he preaches the gospel so much. Right? So we read about the Acts of Paul. He is always going out and preaching the gospel. He has a desire to see the lost get saved. He gets pressed in his spirit. It's something that means something to him. He's not just going through the motions. He's not even just doing things because he knows he's supposed to do them. That's not his motivation. He has it in his spirit, in his soul. He feels it and, he, and he, he has this need and this desire to go out and preach the gospel to people. And you know what? That's something that we all ought to have too. Now, sometimes that might have to start with forcing yourself to go out and do it. You might not have that burden or that urge to want to go out and see people get saved. But I guarantee, well, I can't guarantee you this, but the more you go out, the more likely you are to, to develop that, that type of a spirit, that type of an attitude. The more you talk to people, the more you realize, I mean, the more you get in the Bible, but also even just talking to people. Because when you talk to people, they're real people. I mean, these aren't just numbers. We're not, you know, we talk about soul winning a lot. Soul winning, yeah, you got to preach the gospel, preach the gospel. And it can tend to just be this abstract thing. But when you're preaching the gospel, you're talking to an individual. You're talking to a person. And that person matters. Just like every person matters. And you get a chance to go out and just meet different types of people. I mean, I was out today and had conversations with, I don't know, three or four different people. No one really let me give them the gospel very much. One or two of them might have already been saved. But, um... You know, you talk to these people, and there's a lot of people out there that are going to hell. And the more you kind of talk to people, you'll get to know them. You, you know, you start, you should start to get that type of a burden, thinking like, man, I got to get this person saved. I might never see them again. I might never talk to them again. But here I am. I'm at their door, and and I'm going to preach them the gospel. We ought to have this type of a burden and this type of a spirit, even when you're not, you know, decided. Okay, I'm going to go out and give the gospel and go soul winning for an hour or two hours or whatever. But just all the time. I mean, that's something that you ought to be able to look at people just in general. And when, whenever you're in contact with people, just be thinking, having your spirit pressed, thinking like, because it's the most important thing. I mean, salvation is so critical and so important. You don't know what opportunities you're going to have to talk with people. And as we see here with Paul, he was pressed in the spirit. He's, around, he's surrounded by people that are unbelievers. And his soul is stirred. He's pressing the Spirit to testify that Jesus was Christ. And that's what he did here. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Let's continue on here. In verse number 6, it says, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. 
from henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Now, there comes a time here when we see that where you just have to, to, to shake off the dust of his feet and say, I'm done with you. Because you can waste your time many times Preaching the gospel and just trying to show people and trying to show people and trying to show people and they're just, they're blaspheming, they're opposing themselves, they're not getting it, they don't want to receive it and, and after a while you're just going to have to call it quits and move on to someone else. And this is a good lesson to learn when you're up soul winning because a lot of times you get in a conversation and this is something that I need to take heed to probably more than many other people because I like to, I really like to get in conversation with people. And, and really just do my best to, to preach the gospel and make it as clear as possible. But there's some people you run into that they just, they just want to argue, they want to debate, you know, they're, they're opposing themselves, they're blaspheming. And the temptation could be there to continue, just try to, try to win the argument. Well, if I could just show them this. And a lot of times it's not even just fleshly of just, just trying to win a debate because that's not going to be probable for anybody. You can win a debate all day long, but it doesn't mean that souls are going to get saved and go to heaven. But even just having the right attitude and thinking like, man, I just really want to get this person saved. you got to be able to recognize when people are just blaspheming and opposing themselves and they're not listening and they're not being receptive to just, to just shake off the dust of your feet and move on. Now, one, one phrase that's important here in verse 6, when Paul does this, when Paul decides to move on, look at what he says in the middle of the verse there, he says, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. Now, if you would, please turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Keep your finger on Acts 18. Obviously, we're going to come back to that. But turn to Ezekiel chapter 13. It's one of the major prophets after the book of Psalms. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33. And we're going to see a little bit into why Paul even uses this phrase, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. Look at verse number 2 of Ezekiel 33. The Bible says, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchmen, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, and whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. So what he's talking about here, he's talking about, you know, you have a city, and it's, and it's a walled city, and, it's, and that's their defense. You know, there'd be stone walls, and what they would do is they would set up someone to be a watchman or a few people to be a watchman. And what they would do is they'd stay up all night, and all day, basically, I mean, they would, people, they would take shifts and they'd have somebody on guard watching to make sure that the enemy isn't coming. Because what would happen a lot of times, I mean, the enemy would come, they'd come at night when no one would, can see them and there's not much going on, everyone's asleep. And then they could ambush them and, and take over the city because nobody's prepared, no one's ready, and it's just like a sneak attack. So you'd have these watchmen that would be set up on the, on the towers and they'd be looking out and being, and being vigilant. And just, and just keeping their eyes open and making sure that nobody was coming because if they spotted someone, if they spotted the enemy, hey, they're there to send the warning to the rest of the people so that they don't get destroyed to say, hey, you know, wake up, sound the alarm, get up, get your weapons, get ready to go because we're getting attacked. And they were the first line of defense and it's extremely important for them to have a fighting chance in order to have that person keeping watch and making sure that if danger is coming, if evil is coming their way, he is there to watch for that and to warn everyone else about the, in, in the coming danger. And it says here in verse 4, you know, if the watchman does his job, he sees the people, he's sounding the trumpet, he's sounding the alarm and saying, okay, wake up, you know, they're here, there's people coming. And if people hear that trumpet and they don't take the warning, you know, they're, just like, they're in bed and they're just like, oh yeah, whatever, I'm just going to go, you know, turn over and go back to sleep. It says, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He said, look, you heard the warning. You can't, you don't have any excuse here. You heard the warning, but you decided to do nothing about it. Hey, the person who was, who was watching, you know, he's not responsible anymore. Because here's the thing, if the people were to come... If the enemy were to come and say the watchman was just sleeping, sleeping on a job, not doing his job, 
and and a whole army comes and they overtake the city and and you know and, and they wipe them out or whatever or they they turn them captives well the person who's a watchman is the one that's held responsible for that because it's his job to warn everybody else and if you fail at your job then the, then it says that you know the blood will be on you so it says if people don't heed the warning the blood is on their own head let's continue reading here. verse 5 it says he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning his blood shall be upon him but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul but if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned if the sword come and take any person from among them he is taken away in his iniquity but his blood will i require at the watchman's hand so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman under the house of Israel. He's talking to Ezekiel. He's talking, God's talking to Ezekiel saying, look, I've set you to be a, a watchman in the house of Israel. He just goes through this worldly example of someone physically watching for the enemy coming into the city. He says, so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman in the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. The preacher's job is to warn the people from God. God's talking to the preacher. God is talking to Ezekiel. He's giving them this message. He's saying, look, you are the watchman. You need to warn the people from God and, and tell them what God is going to do. It says in verse 8, it says, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So he's saying here, look, it's a preacher's responsibility, for one, to preach all of God's commandments. And, you know, for example, there's, there's a certain sin or whatever that's going on in the church, or just a, just a commandment that God has given us. We know that God, that you're going to reap what you sow. We know that God is going to judge you for the bad things that you do. If you don't warn people about it, he says, well, the judgment's still going to come upon them, right? I mean, just like the person who's not warned in the city, well, the, the, the invading army is still, going to, is still going to kill them or take them captive or whatever. They're still going to suffer for that. But the responsibility is going to end up falling on the watchman's, on the watchman's head. And it's the same way with preaching. You got a lot of pastors these days, a lot of preachers. They're not warning the flock. They're not warning the congregation. They're not preaching God's word and warning and saying, hey, look, thus saith the Lord. You know, you shouldn't be fornicating. You shouldn't be doing You shouldn't be drinking out. You shouldn't be doing any of these things because God's going to bring judgment upon you. Now, if they go out and do those things, then yeah, God's judgment is still going to come on them. But the pastor's going to be held responsible for that. The preacher's going to be held responsible for that. You can liken this also, though, in what Paul was doing here, not just for the pastor, not just for warning the, the, the church, but for warning souls about salvation, right? This is the broader application. He said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. The reason why he's clean is because he's preached them the gospel. He's warned them. And that's what we need people to do today is say, look, there's a lot of people out there that don't even realize that they're going to hell. They don't even know. They don't know that danger is coming. They don't know the impending doom on their life. They don't even realize that they're damned to hell already because they haven't put their faith in Christ. They don't get it. They think they're just fine. Most people out there today, if you ask them if they know if they're going to heaven or not, they'll say, yeah, probably. I'm pretty sure. You know, they're, They may not know for sure, but they, they think they're pretty good. They, they're not worried about it. They're not too concerned about it. But if they knew the truth, if they had been warned, if you can show them and say, hey, look, no, you are a sinner. You deserve hell. You deserve this punishment. There is this evil that's coming. If you die without Christ, you're going to spend an eternity there. Hey, now you're doing your job. Now you're warning them. You're being a proper watchman. And if they decide not to heed the warning after hearing it, then it's no longer on you. But see, it's our jobs as Christians to go out and to be a watchman. It's our job to warn the people, warn people that there's, a, there's an impending doom because he says, look, I'm going to require that at your hands. If you're not doing your job, if you're not doing the job that God has given you of warning people and letting them know, hey, hell is coming. Hell is coming for you. 
Unless you repent, unless you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, hell is going to come for you. And people need to be warned about that. Now, not everyone's going to receive that message. But it's up to you to give them that message. It's not your job to make them, you know, you can't make them believe, you can't make, make them take heed, but the watchman's job is one that, of, of just that, of warning. You have to give the warning. And that's what we do oftentimes when we go out soul winning. And actually, that's something that I, I try to think of and try to remember to do when we do go out and, and try to give the gospel to people. One of the last things you want to do, you know, let's, let's say you get in a conversation with somebody, right? Because this happens quite a bit. You'll get in a conversation with someone and you'll be preaching them the gospel. But they just think that like, oh yeah, well I don't agree with that. I, you know, I don't agree with, with what you're saying. Like I, don't, I think there's works involved too, but you know, whatever. I'm and, they, and they kind of think they're still good. But they just think like, well, we're just having a difference of opinion here. You think it's by faith. I think it's by faith and works. But, um, you know, it's, it's okay. I mean, we, we both believe in Jesus, so it's fine. And a lot of people have that type of an attitude. I always try to remember to just to warn them and say, well, look, no, you are not saved. Because a, a lot of people think they're saved. And they think they're saved because they're a good person. They think they're saved because they go to church or whatever the reason may be. It's important if they're not going to receive what you're saying to them, you at least have to warn them. You don't want to walk away from a door where someone, you know that they're believing wrong. You know that they're not, their faith is not completely in Christ. You don't want to leave that door with them just, just thinking that you think that they're fine and that, and that everything's good. you got to give them that warning. And it's not a fun message. It's not, it's not the popular message. But it's what's the most needful for people to hear. In, in order for them to even think about it, in order for them to realize at all that they're in danger, that they're in danger of hellfire, they need to be, they need to be told it. It needs to be pointed out to them. And your job as a watchman is to do that. Now, every time you give the gospel, you're warning people about that. I mean, you have to, people have to understand that they need to get saved from something. You understand that you're a sinner. You understand that you've done wrong and you deserve this punishment that God has for us. So all soul winnings, uh, uh, you know, is a warning. But with some people specifically, they, they hear that and they'll agree with it. Oh, yeah, okay, but they think they're fine. They think they're already saved. But they're trusting in works. They're trusting in baptism. They're trusting in whatever it may be. And if you realize that, if you know that, and they're still rejecting grace by faith, or salvation by grace through faith, then, then you have to warn them. You say, look, I don't think you're saved. And and because the Bible says it's it's just by grace. You know, and just kind of explain to them, if you died, you know, you're going to go to hell because all of your faith isn't in Christ. You believe you're trusting in some kind of a works. And, you know, oftentimes that doesn't go over very well. But it's the loving thing to do. If, uh, you know, think about if you were on your way to hell, if you, if, if, if you weren't saved, and you thought you were, and you thought everything was good, and someone else knew, someone else had that knowledge to know that you are not saved, wouldn't you much rather have them try to tell you, and just try to tell you, look, you're not saved, than, than just to ignore it and pretend like everything's just fine? I mean, it would be in your best interest for someone, even if you didn't receive it, even if it was something you didn't want to hear, I mean, that's the best chance you have is to at least have someone tell you, look, you're not saved, and try to get you to think about that. And that's what we need to do when we're out soul winning, is to, you know, there's this urge to not really want to offend anybody. And the goal isn't to go out and offend people, right? But you have to always preach the truth, and you have to give warning. That's part of the job. That's part of the job of being a watchman is... Your job is not bringing good news. I mean, it is. You're bringing a good news that the salvation is by grace and faith. But, but oftentimes, people have to understand the bad news part of it. The bad news is that you're a sinner and you deserve to go to hell. And, and if you don't get that, then the good news isn't going to mean anything if you don't understand the bad news first. But um, anyways, that's why Paul used this, um, this phrase, your blood be upon your own heads. Uh, let's go back to Acts chapter 18. Because he, he treated uh, giving the gospel that way. He was being a watchman. He said, look, I'm no longer responsible. You can't hold me responsible for you dying and going to hell. Because I have given you enough opportunity. I've, I've made it clear. I've preached God's word unto you. Your blood be upon your own heads. 
And he said, I'm clean from henceforth. I'm going to go on to the Gentiles. I'm done. I've spent plenty of time with you. And we got to remember also to keep this kind of an attitude to just move on. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, don't let this get you down. Because a lot of times, too, it's easy to get, to get discouraged when you're giving the gospel to people and, just, and, and they're just not receiving it, they're not taking it. Hey, don't get discouraged. Just, just shake the dust off your feet and, and keep moving forward. There's a lot of people, for all the people that are going to argue with you, for all the people who aren't going to get saved and they don't want to listen, there's going to be some people that, are, that will listen. So you just got to just, just stick with it. Don't get too caught up with those that are just opposing themselves and blaspheming. But just keep moving on to the, to the, next, to the next house, the next door, the next person. But let's, uh, let's continue reading here in verse number 7. The Bible says, And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. So, in the story here, keep in mind, what was Paul doing first? He was going into the Sabbath, uh, into the Sabbath. Every Sabbath he was going into the synagogue and he was preaching to the Jews, right? That's, and that's what he did almost everywhere he goes. He'll go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he'll try to teach He'll preach and, and, and try to prove that Jesus was Christ and he'll, and he'll use the scriptures to prove that in the synagogues. So now he gets into this and he's just like, look, I'm done. I'm going to the Gentiles. But look where he stays. He stays at a, at a man named Justice. And it says his house joined heart to the synagogue. So the synagogue where he's just coming out of, he was spending all these Sabbath days. He's in that region of Egypt. Now he's staying basically right next door to the synagogue. So it's kind of funny because he's, stay, you know, he's just staying right next to them. And he just had this whole, you know, blowout with him. But, um, so this is where he's at in verse 7. And then in verse number 8, it says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. So we see here that, that Paul actually reached Crispus. He's the chief ruler of the synagogue. He was the, um, you know, he was in charge of that synagogue. He actually became a believer. He believed on Jesus Christ. So, you know, his work there wasn't in vain. He, he, he made a lot of good effort. He, made, he, he got the chief ruler saved. But he ended up getting to the point where he's just like, I can't explain this to you anymore. I'm done with you. Let's keep reading here in verse number 8. It says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. So here we see a message from God. Paul receives this vision in, in the night. And God tells him, he's comforting him. He's, giving, he's encouraging him. He's saying, look. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of this people. You've run into a lot of resistance. And if you think about it, Paul's gone through a lot already up to this point. He's been in prison. He's been beaten up. He's suffered a lot of persecution just over time by preaching. And now he's, he's you know, gone, gone out of the synagogue and just said, I'm done with you people. And, God's, and, and we don't know everything that's going on there, but, but God speaks to him. And he says, don't be afraid of them. Just speak. Don't hold your peace. Hold your peace means be quiet, right? He says, for I am with thee, and no man shall send thee to hurt thee. So he says, look, nobody's going to hurt you here. He says, I am with you. Don't be afraid of them, and speak. God comforts them. And um, we see oftentimes preachers need to be reminded not to be afraid of men and what the reaction might be to the preaching of God's word. And this is an admonition that's found in many places in the Bible. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were actually comforted the same way that Paul was here. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So God saying, look, you're preaching my word. I'm with you. Don't, don't worry about them. He said, don't be afraid of their faces. Right? And when you're preaching, 
And if you haven't preached before, especially like preaching behind a pulpit or preaching in front of a bunch of people, he says, be not afraid of their faces. Well, when you say things, you know, and you're just preaching the Bible, but when you're just making the Bible plain, you're preaching what the Bible says, oftentimes you'll have people that'll start making faces because they don't like what you're saying. They don't, basically, they don't like what the Bible says. And a lot of times people will be like, you know, start making faces. He says, look, don't be afraid of their faces. People get angry. And this happens even when you go out at the door, you know, when you're, when you're going to preach the gospel to somebody. People start getting uncomfortable and start getting angry and start mentioning hell or, or whatever it may be. Hey, don't be afraid of that. Don't let that, don't let that make you hold your peace. Don't let that shut you up. Don't be afraid of what people might do to you or think of you or whatever. Because the Bible says that God's saying, look, I'm with you. Don't be afraid of their faces. I am with you to deliver them. I'll be able to save you. And he, he told Ezekiel basically the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 5. The Bible reads, And they, whether, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, talking about the children of Israel who he was supposed to be preaching to, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. Again, God's admonishing Ezekiel here. He admonished Jeremiah, Paul, Ezekiel, telling them, look, just speak my words. I'm giving you the words. You are the messenger. I've given you this job. Preach my words. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of what they might say. Don't be afraid of what, how they might look at you. Don't be afraid of what they might do. Don't worry whether or not they're going to listen. This is what he's telling Ezekiel. He said, they're a rebellious house. They rebel against God. But he's saying, look, whether they're going to hear you or whether they're going to not hear you, whether they're going to forbear. He says, don't worry about that. You just preach my word. You make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to. And it says, I'm going to actually turn there because the rest of that, I don't have it in my notes, but the rest of that, um, that section of scripture after verse 7 in Ezekiel 2, he gives, he gives Ezekiel the warning then that he shouldn't be rebellious like the rest of the children of Israel are in not preaching God's word. And um, yeah, 2 verse 8 says, But thou, son of man, Hear what I say unto thee, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning woe. So he's saying, look, you don't be rebellious like them. You just need to preach my word. I've given you this job to do it. Don't worry about whether they will hear it. Don't worry, worry about what they're going to do or what they're going to say. You just need to preach. And we need to be reminded of that oftentimes. And, and, and we got to understand, look, God's telling Jeremiah, he told Ezekiel, he told Paul, as I mentioned, these were great men of God, but they all need to be comforted with God's word and knowing that God is with you. And look, if you're going out and preaching the gospel, God's with you. If you're preaching God's word, if you're preaching the truth, God will be with you. Look, and, and you know, you're keeping yourself clean and keeping yourself a vessel that's that's meet to be used by the master. You know, you're not just living in all kinds of sin. God will be with you. And and if you're doing the work that God has set out for you to do, God will be with you to deliver you. Don't worry about the consequences. Don't worry about what people might say or think or do. Just know that you're doing what God has for you to do. And and on the contrary, don't uh, don't forbear to, to preach God's word. It was a warning even to Ezekiel saying, look, I'm telling you to do this stuff. You better not be rebellious like they are. You need to preach the word. In uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible reads, Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And this is Jesus Christ speaking, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do, but I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. 
Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. So Jesus Christ was basically saying, look, you know, what you hear in the closets, you should that should be proclaimed upon the housetops. Don't hold it in. You know, God has made you a light. A light isn't made to be put underneath a bushel. A light is made to be put on a candlestick and just for the whole world to see. God wants his word to get out there. Yeah, you didn't get saved so that you could keep that to yourself and you could go high in your house and just comment on how the whole world's going to hell. That's not what he saved you for. He saved you to be a light to shine unto the, to the lost world, to bring the word and to spread it unto other people and to be like that light to shine out and, and, and shine as much as possible to proclaim his word upon the house house. Make sure everybody knows about it. Everybody hears about it. And not to be afraid of them that kill the body, which is all about man. Man has the power to kill you. Man has the power to take away your, your physical life on this earth. That's about the worst that they can do to you. They can throw you in prison, maybe give you a beating, do whatever, whatever bad things you can think of, and then ultimately just, just extinguish your life. That's about the worst they can do. But he's saying don't fear that. Don't fear what man can do to you. Don't fear anything like that. He said, what you ought to do is fear God. God's the one that has the power to cast people into hell. God's the one that has the power of eternal punishment, eternal torture. Don't fear what man's going to do to you. Just fear God and keep his commandments and be that light that shines. That's what God wants you to do. And we see here, Paul got that, that, that word of encouragement from God in a vision when, um, when he told them, look, don't worry about it. Just keep preaching. Don't hold your peace. And that's something that we need to adhere to today, that we don't ever silence our tongue. Even if the world's going to hell, even if people don't want to hear it, and, we live, and you live in a wicked society, you live in a wicked town or whatever, where nobody wants to hear what you have to say, hey, it's still your job to preach the truth. It's still your job to go out and preach the Bible and to preach God's word. Um, he, God is not you know, taking that job away from you. But let's keep reading here in Acts 18. Let's look at verse number 11. It says, And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So he keeps preaching. He listens to God. He trusts God. And he's there for a year and six months. Verse 12. It says, And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. So here we see Paul's there, he's teaching and preaching a year and a half. And then the Jews, it says when Gallio was the deputy, Gallio gives in charge, and um, the Jews are mad, so they, they, they make an insurrection against Paul. They, they basically, they take him, they arrest him, they bring him to Gallio, and they're saying, look, this guy's you know, teaching men to, to worship God contrary to the law. And just as Paul's about to speak, he's about to, like, to defend himself and, and give an answer, Gallio just, just stops him, he doesn't even let him talk, and he's just saying, look, if, if this is about your, you know, if it was some wickedness or some lewdness that he was doing, okay, I'd listen to you. But if this is just some, some questions about names and basically like your religion, you know, I'm not going to be a judge of that. He's like, I don't care about that. Get out of here. And he drave them from the judgment. He's just like, get out of here. Stop wasting my time. I'm not going to be a judge over these matters. But then look and see what happens here. It says, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of these things. Now, I'm going to bring up something here, and I'm going to, I'm going to be honest right up front. I don't know exactly. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple of things that, that I'm thinking about with this, but, it, but it's real interesting to me because we saw earlier in verse number 8, it says, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, Believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. In verse 8, it says that Crispus was the chief ruler of the synagogue, right? And it says that he believed, he was saved. But then in verse 17, it says, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue. 
So we have two different names here, right? And I, and I looked, I did a word search on both of their names, and the only other place they come up is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which makes sense because they're in Corinth right now. This is all taking place in Corinth, and in 1 Corinthians, both of those names are mentioned in chapter 1. It says in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 1, uh, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So here it's calling Sosthenes a brother in Christ. And then in verse 14 it says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. So at first I'm thinking like, you know, you know a lot of people get different names. You know, in the Bible there's many people will say like, you know, Saul was changed to Paul. Um, Peter, his name was Cephas, right? His name was Simon and it was changed to Cephas or Peter. Um, depending on the language, Cephas and Peter are basically the same thing. But, uh, you know, people have received different names in the Bible. So I'm thinking, like, well, it's possible that, that Crispus, his name became Sosthenes. That's one possibility. Um, but the fact that they're both kind of mentioned here and in 1 Corinthians 14 makes you, think, it makes you wonder about that. But you also figure, well, he got saved... And there was a problem with the synagogue. Did maybe they oust Crispus? Because this happened a year and a half later. Paul was teaching and preaching, you know, after it says that Crispus believed and everything else, all the other problems. He stayed there. He continued to teach and preach for a year and a half. And then it says, when Gallio was deputy, which means time had passed, then they made this insurrection, then they brought him up. And then you have the, um, the Greeks taking Sosthenes, which is another weird thing because the Jews were the one that took up a problem with Paul. They're the ones that brought up the accusations. They're the ones that brought him before the judgment seat. But then it says the Greeks took Sosthenes and beat him uh, before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of those things. So, basically what we see out of this, at least with Gallio, Gallio basically doesn't care about any of it. He's not, he's not some real just guy. Like, he's not some really... Um, you know, I, I doubt it was lawful for these people just to, to beat Sosthenes, right? But he just doesn't care about any of it. He's just like, you guys just deal with your own problems. I don't want to deal with any of this stuff. But I, I think it's kind of interesting that you see here in both places that there's these two chief rulers of the synagogues. Is it the same person? I don't quite know. Um, Anybody that, that, that has more insight in this, I'm interested to, to, to learn more about that. And that's why I bring it up. Um, you know, I'm going to teach what I know and preach what I know, but I, I, I've noticed this. I don't know exactly for sure, solidly, what, what the correlation here is, if it's the same person or not. And um, I can assume, and I assume that the people in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 are the same names, are the same people with the same names in here. Um, that seems like it would make sense that they're both in Corinth. But um, in 1 Corinthians 1, Sosthenes was also a believer, so... I don't know. Is it the same person? You, you tell me. Tell me what you think um, about that. If you have any thoughts or study, want to study that out, it's kind of interesting. But let's continue on here with the story in, chat, in verse 18. It says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria. And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. Now I'm going to get into this, and in, I think it's Acts 22, um, we're getting a lot more detailed into, into this vow that Paul makes because he, I don't believe he should have done that. I believe he was sinning when he takes his vow. But we'll get into that in another chapter. We'll continue on here. Verse 19 says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And it's funny because Paul has a habit. He continues to do this, right? He goes into the synagogue. Like everywhere he goes, he's going to the synagogue. He teaches and preaches. And this isn't the first time here where we said, okay, I'm done with you. Now I'm going to the Gentiles. And, um, and then it's like, what does he do next? He goes into the synagogue, right? <laughs> but I think what's happening, though, is that he's giving up on them in that specific location. He's not just forsaking all the Jews everywhere. He's not like preaching in one place and saying, okay, well, now I'm just going to the Gentiles. Forget you guys. I'm done with you. I think he's just saying that in each individual location that he goes to. But notice... Notice how they're not very receptive overall still because it happens over and over again. I mean, he's still, he's still going to the synagogue. He's still trying to reach the Jews. He's still trying to prove that, that Jesus was Christ. But 
I mean, by and large, he's getting a lot more salvations, a lot more people saved, people a lot more receptive that are not the Jews. When he goes on the Gentiles, I mean, he's getting multitudes saved, he's getting the Greeks saved, and um, it's just kind of the way it, it was at that time, and even still to this day, I mean, a lot of Jews are hardening their heart, and, um, and it's too bad. You know, we still love them and want to try to save them and, and you know, preach the gospel to them. But, um, but in these days especially, you know, Paul just kept, he kept preaching to them and then, and then having to just, just be done with it because they were too stiff-necked. But let's continue here in verse 20. It says, And when they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. So in this in this synagogue, they actually wanted him to stay longer. So this is one. This is the exception, right? This is a place where they're not they're not arguing with them. They want him to stay longer. But he goes and look at what it says there in verse twenty one. It says, "But I will return again unto you, if God will." And he sailed from Ephesus. And this is a great. This is this is something that's mentioned in other places in Scripture, and it's a type of attitude that we ought to have. He says, look, I want to come back and visit you, and I will. Will in the Bible basically means want. If you think about somebody's will, someone's going to create a will. It's their wishes of what they want to happen with their possessions, with their, you know, with money, or with whatever it is that they're leaving behind. It's their, their will is their wishes. I want this to happen. I want this person. I want this family member to have this. I want this to go here, this to go there. It's their wishes. And we, in, in modern English, when we, when we speak, when I say, I will go to Walmart, you're thinking, like, like you're saying, I am going to go. Like, I will go, I'm going to go there. Not, not as much, I want to go there, right? The Bible says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. That means that God doesn't want anyone to perish. But what Paul's saying here, he's saying, look, I will return again unto you. I want to come to you, and, I, and, I, and, I, and he's going to do it, but he says, if God will. So if that's in God's will, then I'm going to do it because he wants to, right? He said, I want to come to you, but only if it's in God's will. And he said from Ephesus, now turn if you would to James chapter number four. James four, while you're turning there, I'll read you Proverbs 27, one. Proverbs 27, one says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So he's saying, don't, don't be bragging and boasting about what you're going to do tomorrow. And all these plans and all those things you have laid out for tomorrow, he says, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You don't even know what's going to happen today. Or what, you know, what's going to happen by the end of the day or what's going to happen tomorrow. So don't brag about it. Don't boast about it. James chapter 4, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or do that. So what it is, is it's a mindset and it's an attitude of saying, whatever it is that you want to do with your life, all the things that you, the plans that you're making, and it's not saying it's bad to make plans. Okay, the Bible says, we, we already saw that last week about, you know, counting the cost and making sure that you have enough and make it, you know, you can make goals and make plans. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't boast about these things that you're going to do. Like I said in James 4, he says, today or tomorrow we're going to such a city and we're going to continue there for a year. We're going to buy, we're going to sell, we're going to be prosperous, we're going to get gain, we're going to be profitable at this. He says, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen on the morrow, let alone in a year from now. He says, what is your life? It's even a vapor. Like you're here for such a short period of time. Don't boast yourself of these things. He says, for that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. We need to be focused on if it's God's will. A lot more than if it's our own. We, it's not bad to have your own wants and have your own wishes and have your own goals and have your own plans. But always keep that in mind that... that you need to make sure that it's, if, if the Lord will, we shall do this or that. And not to get too caught up and to get too proud on things that are going to happen tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now and all these great plans that you have. You should be more concerned about if the Lord will. And, um, and that's what Paul is doing here. 
And as I said, it's mentioned in, in, in other places that that type of philosophy or that type of mindset that we ought to have is mentioned in the Bible. But let's continue reading. We're almost done with the chapter. Um, verse 22 says, And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So he's going back. He's visiting the saints. He's visiting the churches. And he's strengthening them and greeting them in, in a lot of the places they've been, in Antioch and Galatia. And as it says in verse 24, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now, eloquent means that he's a, well, he's a good speaker. I mean, he's someone who is, he had a talent, he had a great ability of being eloquent and being able to say things in a way that people could understand. And it says he was mighty in the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. It says, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So here, he's got a fervent spirit. I mean, this guy is on fire. This guy is serving God. He knows the scriptures. He's a good speaker. He's putting his talent to good use. He's going out and, and teaching diligently the things of the Lord. But, it, but the only thing is, it says he knew only the baptism of John. So basically, you have a man here. Was he saved? Of course he was saved. And this is what people have to understand, too, especially with Jesus. And especially being in the New Testament now, we know that you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And we know that because this already happened in the past. But what about the people who didn't know Jesus by name? Like anybody who lived prior to Jesus Christ being born, right? Those people were still saved by grace. They put their faith in the Lord. They put their faith in God. They didn't know the name of Jesus Christ, but just because they didn't know his name doesn't mean they didn't put their faith on him. It doesn't mean they didn't believe in the Christ. It doesn't mean that they didn't have their faith in him to save them. They just didn't know who it was by name that it was going to be. And that's how it was here with Apollos. He believed. I mean, he heard John the Baptist preaching. John the Baptist was preaching of one that was going to come after him. You know, the latchet of whose shoes he's not worthy to loose. But he, apparently he left before Jesus came on the scene because John came to prepare the way for the Lord. John the Baptist was preaching and getting things prepared and getting things ready for Jesus Christ to, to show up and to, and to do his ministry. So this man, Apollos, he only knew the baptism of John. But he still knew the scriptures. He was still saved, and he was still doing a good work. But then we see in verse 26, it says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. He's preaching with boldness. He's preaching, um, you know, the Bible. He's preaching about the Lord. It says, Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. More perfectly means more completely. Basically, they, they, they explain Jesus Christ to them, and they're saying, you know, they knew he was saved, but they're saying, okay, look, you need to understand, Jesus came. It, it was, his name was Jesus. Christ came. It was Jesus. And, um, you know, tell them all about what Jesus did and all this stuff, because he hadn't heard about him. He didn't know. And then verse 27, it says, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, talking about Apollos, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ so here we have a man he was a great man of God too he did a lot of great works you read about Apollos not just in, in, in multiple places throughout the throughout the New Testament he's in first and second Corinthians and he was actually one of the guys where um you know, he had his own following. People were saying, people were getting divisive, saying like, oh, well, I follow Paul, and I follow Peter. And other people were saying, well, I follow Apollos. You know, that was like their, their figurehead. That was their guy. And, you know, if they would have this division between the brethren, because for whatever reason, they thought it was better that they were following one man over another man. And that's what Paul rebukes him for that in his letters to the Corinthians. But, um, but you see that Apollos is one of them. Which means, that, I mean, he was an eloquent man. He was a great speaker. He was powerful. He was fervent in spirit. He did a lot of great teaching. And think about this. He had never seen Jesus Christ. He didn't even know about him. 
Yet he had this fervent spirit, he had this, this attitude, and he was still able to prove, using the scripture, that's what it says in that last verse there, verse 28, he says, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Having never met him, having never seen the deeds that Jesus Christ did, he was still able to use the scriptures to prove that Jesus was Christ. And this is important because even though it's all the way back in those days, this is what we do today. We have not seen Jesus Christ. We have not seen any of his miracles and the works that he does, that he did physically when he walked on this earth. Yet we can still prove from the scriptures that Jesus was Christ, that Jesus was God come in the flesh. We have the scriptures that prove that. Jesus fulfilled all these scriptures. And upon hearing all these things that Jesus did and, 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 and all the prophecies that he fulfilled and knowing that this, that this man that came and happened, he fulfilled all, the, all the, the, the prophecies, he was able to prove that by the scriptures. Oh, wow, Jesus did this and he did that. Yes, that's the Christ. Yeah, he's the one that came to die on the cross for our sins. It is fulfilled. And when he, had, when, he rela when he had heard that himself and it was expounded unto him, he was able to preach and to show other, people's, other people and to prove it to them. And that's exactly what we have to do today. You see, you can look at the Apostle Paul and say, well, but he was one, like one born out of due time, though. He didn't really see Jesus necessarily when he was on his earth. He, was, he saw him on the road to Damascus, right? But you look at Peter and James and John, you say, well, they were disciples. They were with Jesus they saw him doing these things. That's why they could so, so mightily go out and, and witness the people and get them saved and do all those great works for God because they were actually with him. But here we see Apollos, which was, uh, was, was definitely a great man of God, did lots of great works, didn't even know the name of Jesus, but he knew the Bible and he was, he was saved, he was a believer. And when he learned a little bit more and understood that Jesus, that Jesus had come and was the Christ, he was able to prove that from Scripture. And that's what we need to do today, is to be able to, to prove to people with the Bible, with Scripture, that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Savior, Jesus is the one that you need to turn to, that you need to trust in, in order to be saved. And, you know, this, this sermon tonight, this, this chapter is really focused a lot on soul winning. And you look at, you look at what's going on, and actually, I mean, the entire book of Acts is, is centralized around that, because that is central in our life. As a Christian, that is, that is one of the most important things that you can be doing with your life at all. Laying up those eternal rewards in heaven. I mean, we get so distracted with so many things in this life, but how important are they? How important are they? There's so many things to get, to get caught up in and to get busy in and, and to do and to get wrapped up in, but how important is it really? Our life is but a vapor. We read that in James chapter 4. We're here for such a short period of time. Make the best use of the time that you have now. And, and one of the ways to do that is by preaching the gospel and don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of what people can do. But, but to preach and have faith in God. And let's bow our heads and word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the book of Acts. And I thank you for the great examples that we have. Lord, I pray that you would please press our spirits. Lord, if we're saved today, that we, we, we know that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. I pray that you would please use the Holy Spirit to press our spirits to be thinking of the lost, to be, to be pressured into going out and to witnessing for, your, for the cause of Christ, to be, to be bringing the gospel of salvation to a lost world. Lord, I pray that you would please strengthen us and embolden us not to be worried about what people are going to say or think or do but that we would just um, do what you've commanded us to do. And um, Lord, help us all to, to learn and to grow and to understand more about what you'd have for us to know from your words. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.